class. How much of that did he come up with himself, that posture? And even, he, even his mouth is twisted. He talks out of the side of his mouth through his teeth. Uh, all of it. All of it. At a certain point, kind of early on, I think Joaquin let me know that he actually, his shoulder is kind of a, been a bit, of, I think from birth, he's got a kind of a messy shoulder. And, and he's probably spent a lot of time trying to hide it or stand up straight so that if he kind of, kind of twists his body around and he sort of said, do you think it'd be all right if I do this? And I said, sure, great. And But a couple of days into the film, he just sort of was feeling more comfortable and just kept sliding into the skin that he was doing that kind of this movement that were so incredible i didn't i just didn't want to jinx anything and say what are you doing or what's going on you know it's kind of you're in the middle of make believe you don't want to break the spell you just kind of want to watch him do whatever he's doing and i kind of have my own theories about it cuz you know, he puts his hands on his hips and sort of stuff about his kidneys being all torn up from from the war maybe something happened maybe it, Maybe it's just easier. Maybe it's comfortable for him to kind of reach back and hold his kidneys and help his, help him stand. Um, but then again, yeah, there's always that thing, you know, sort of the way somebody holds himself is an extension of of of, of what they're what's going on with them on the inside. And I buy that too for sure. You know, I definitely see that. You know, you see that when you're standing up straight or you're bouncing down the street or when you're you can barely kind of put one foot in front of the other. You know, it's absolutely true. It must have been so interesting for you as the writer and director to see the the physical interpretation that Joaquin Phoenix brought to the role, which is not something that you had put in the script. Yeah, but thrilling, great, it's so exciting. You know, you, you you hope for that kind of thing. You hope for an inventive actor to come along and make it not just three dimensional but you know five dimensional six dimensions you know and that's that's what he does he's that kind of guy he's that kind of actor um he'll do crazy things and they'll either be right or wrong but they're they're worth trying he's amazing to work with amazing i read he stayed in character through the movie even on the set yeah, is that whatever right? that means it's such a weird phrase isn't it staying in character it kind of connotates some kind of bizarre i don't know um I don't. It wouldn't. I don't know. We've got, we've got to find a new way to say stays in character. Maybe how about an, an enormous level of concentration? That's what I would say. Right. It's, you know, it's 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 like that. It's everybody knows it's make believe, and you're just trying to do your absolute best at at make believe. And to do that, sometimes you just you really have to concentrate and and tune a lot of stuff out, and that. And that's very hard, very hard. It requires an enormous amount of focus and concentration. So, But just physically, to have to stay <laughs> twisted like that when when you're not in a scene, uh, that must be um, very uncomfortable. Right. But probably probably fun. As it may, I mean, I dare say probably a kind of joy to sort of, I mean, somebody said you can, you can check out of your skin for three months mm -hmm. and be somebody else, you know. Don't worry, you'll still be there when you get back in three months. Would you do it? I think many of us would if we well, could. But that's so interesting because people are checking out of themselves when they're acting in your films. And because your films get so kind of beneath the surface of character that they are really checking out of their se themselves and checking into these characters. But you have to be so kind of aware of everything because you're the writer director. You have to be taking care of everything. Um, so, like every, everybody's, you know, everybody's in this make believe world in a way. But but are you? Uh oh! I don't... <laughs> you think the budget also probably? I mean, you know that like what time are the union hours over? <laughs> Yeah, you know, but the, but I don't want to give the impression that you're sort of working with some crazy people and you've sort of got to be the... Everybody, you know, you know you're making a movie and everybody knows what the hours are and what a kind of... how to kind of create maximum effect, you know. Mm -hmm, no one yeah. likes to go to work in the middle of the night. No one likes to kind of do really heavy-duty stuff early in the morning, you know? You're sort of working on making this thing, and you work together, and you're trying to get everybody 
at their best and make sure that the hours aren't too crazy and make sure that the schedule allows that you're doing a kind of a lighter scene after you did a heavy one or whatever it is. It's all that kind of time management. And everybody appreciates that. Everybody's happy about that, you know. Joaquin doesn't want to try to go spend all his energy doing, you know, a big scene and then have to do another one right after that. You're just, you're all kind of working together, figuring the whole thing out. At its, at its best, a film set is when everybody knows what's going on and everybody's working together. At its worst is when something's been lost in the communication and an actor's not sure how many shots are left or what's going on and the makeup department's confused and every, you know, I mean, I'm sure the angle overhead watching that moment is like all these kind of little ants banging into each other and going different directions. And those moments happen and they're a drag. They're a drag for everybody, but I'm trying to get back on course and go right. In the master, Amy Adams plays the wife of the cult leader, and she's like his third or fourth wife. But, but through his group, through his cult called The Cause, he's perfected marriage. <laughs> marriage is better now than it used to be. <laughs> he tells that to everybody. But anyway, she's, she, um, she's really like the power behind him in some ways. She has this like odd kind of control. And um, she was recently on our show. Mm-hmm. And we were talking about a scene, and the story behind the scene really surprised me. There's a scene in which she has to read a page of, like, Victorian pornography to yeah. the Joaquin Phoenix character, to this lost soul who's now, you know, um, on the fringes of, of this cult. And she's trying to desensitize him to his sexual obsessions. And right. what, she t- what she told me was that um, you came on the set one day, that that scene had not been in the script, You came on the set, gave her this um, page of a book to read, and said, okay, read it. (laughs) And that that was her preparation. Um, So so tell us the story from your point of view. It's pretty close to that. You know, we had a sequence in the film where that, that the sequence that you're referring to where some things were written and some things were just kind of very loosely sketched out. And I knew I wanted to collect a lot of different things. I had a kind of list of of different exercises that I'd either made up or pulled from different sources um, or stored in the back of my mind. That day in particular was a day where um, a bunch of our cameras had had, uh, broke. We were shooting these 65-millimeter cameras, and we were supposed to do a scene, and the cameras broke. So we kind of found ourselves with about three or four hours when all those cameras were getting fixed where we could shoot with this other smaller camera, regular traditional 35-millimeter camera. And Amy was around that day, and it was a kind of a great situation where we were shooting, which is this kind of island called Mare Island, where basically all our locations were in about a one or two block radius. So we could we had a lot of freedom to do whatever came up, and we had some time to kill. And uh, Amy was around, and I presented this idea to her. I think we tried it um, with some other people too, doing it just to see how it worked, and it wasn't as effective. And I kind of thought that the best idea was to have Amy do it. Um, probably just the perverse thrill of seeing her character read these kind of really dirty, <laughs> dirty, dirty words. You know, there's something great about that. So we found, um, I'd remembered this book, this Victorian birth porn, kind of a kind of a X-rated book from a long time ago called The Pearl. We tried to find it online. We couldn't find it. And, you know, clock's ticking and we needed something to shoot. And we found uh, some Victorian porn online and printed it out. And had and found the sections that we liked and made us laugh and had her read it. And yeah, it was really hard not to laugh. I had to step out of the room. She did great. <laughs> did you really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh god. Yeah, it was great. Really fun. No. I, another thing Amy Adams said when I spoke to her is that there's as part of like the exercises and training that the Walking Phoenix character is going through as he's being um you know, entering the cult. She asks him a lot of questions, and um, there's a scene where she says to him, "What she say? Look into my eyes." Yeah, yeah. What color? Are what my color eyes? my eyes? What color are my change eyes? Change the color of my yeah, eyes. Yeah, change right? the color of my eyes. Change them to black. And mm-hmm. all we're seeing is her saying this, and mm-hmm. and she said that, and then we we see his eyes, uh, and then we see him, her eyes changing to black because he's imagining them changing to black like she's asking him to. But um, she said that you just came in and, and said, okay, look into the camera. I'm going to read you some lines, and I want you to read them back. And Sort of. Yeah, it was sort of like that. It's a weird thing. You know, there's absolute, There's kind of no scene to do there. You, 
it's not like a traditional scene you're walking into. You figure out what's going on. You're asking an actor to look into the camera, not connect with anybody else. So it's all so detached and weird and bizarre. Um, and Amy came in, and again, it was on that same day. We Our cameras were broke, so we kind of needed something to do. Um, and the we just sort of talked, the idea of the exercise is how to how to use your mind to 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 change things to change what you perceive and what and what your perception is change my the color of my eyes to black you know so yeah poor amy is staring into the camera she kind of looked at me afterwards like she was under some kind of weird spell she's like this is weird i don't this is really bizarre she was kind of freaked out by it then joaquin sat down and stared into the camera and <laughs> He had fun doing it. I don't know, it's weird. I think you can see yourself probably refl- reflected in the lens as well. Oh, interesting. Uh, which is probably kind of not. It's not. It's not. It's not real acting. It's a kind of a, fu- a funny modeling thing. It's very hard to do. It's kind of very awkward um, to to sort of pull that out um, in the middle of the day. Well, I you know admire I mean? you. You came Make up with sense? yeah. You came up with these like great great moments because cameras were broken. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. Yeah, yeah. So the film opens during in the final days of World War II, just as the war is ending, and then it, it kind of jumps ahead to 1950. Um, why did you want to set it then? You know, why wouldn't you? It's it's a great, you know, just on the surface level, that time is so great. I mean, just, just from a kind of pure... Uh, cars and girls and outfits and hairdos and music point of view, on that real simple level, that's just like you know, delicious time, you know, for making a film. You know, I I just love that era. I've always have. It was kind of my dad's era, um, I think, in terms of, certainly in terms of music and coming back from the war. And it's just, it's thick and full of stuff. Um, to me, it was, at least. And sort of just a gravity towards it that it's hard to put my finger on exactly why. But, you know, a couple of reasons, I'm sure that... Uh, um, it just speaks to me somehow. You know, all the songs that period I grew up listening to um, with my dad driving around. So, you know, any time I get a whiff of that stuff, I'm just sort of go to it like it's freshly baked cookies to me. Well, you mentioned the songs from the period. You use some songs from the period in the soundtrack. And I, I want to play an excerpt of one of them. Um, this is probably my favorite of the songs that you use. It's um, 